15. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Orange County School Board's regularly scheduled meeting for this Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. We thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Most of our board members are here in person. We do have member uh, Vice Chair Gould, who is not able to be with us this evening, and member Cobert is attending virtually. So, member Cobert, let me just check in and make sure you're with us. I am here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Member Cobert, and thank you for joining us this evening. I also want to remind the public that the board members will not be engaged in outside electronic or digital communication during the meeting so that we can focus our time and attention to the matters in front of us. To my fellow board members, district staff, and members of the public, I want to remind everybody to speak as close to the mic as possible and to speak directly into the mic. You will probably notice that when I turn my head sideways, as I frequently do, it goes in and out. So um, I say this often, try to do as I say and not as I do, and I'll do my best to try to speak more directly into the mic so that you can hear during the meeting. We're going to begin our meeting as we usually do with a moment of silence, and then I'll invite you to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And now for the pledge. I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Dr. Jenkins, do we have any newly appointed administrators to recognize this evening? We do, Madam Chair, members Thank of the board. You. We have Adrian Anderson, who will be the new assistant principal at Ivy Lane Elementary. Nibria Johnson, who will be the new assistant principal at Dr. Phillips High School. Ernest Labee, who will be the new assistant principal at Carver Middle School. John Miller, who will be the assistant principal at Meadowbrook Middle. Stephen Morsher, who will be the assistant principal at Lake Nona High School. Michelle Nee, who will be the assistant principal at Oak Hill Elementary. Pamela Rump will be the assistant principal at McCoy Elementary. Judy Brandford will be the principal of Conway Elementary. Patricia Sells will be the principal of Eagle Creek Elementary. Desiree Hitchman Houghton will be the principal of Shenandoah Elementary School. That is it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we begin the uh, formal portion of our meeting, I want to recognize that we do not have our vice chair, Member Gould, with us this evening. Our normal protocol would be that we would call on the immediate preceding vice chair, and that would be Member Cobert, who's not here in person. So I'm going to ask for a nomination from the floor for an acting vice chair for this evening. Member Gallo, you're recognized. I nominate Melissa Bird. All right. Member Bird, you I accept? I'd be happy to. Wonderful. Um, I second. Member Castor Dental seconds the motion for uh, Member Bird. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, Member Cobert? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Member Bird, um, I need to excuse myself and you're in charge now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it just, just dawned on me. <laughs> um, let me ask uh, Dr. Jenkins if there are any changes to this evening's agenda. Madam Chair, members of the board, there is one change to the agenda. We have an additional item, 1701, request approval of a one-time bonus for all OCPS classified employees in benefited positions. That is due to our collective bargaining with OESPA. Wonderful. Thank you. Chair finds cause to amend the agenda. Is there a motion to amend the agenda? So moved. So moved. Motion by Member Castor Dental. Is there a second? Second by Member Gallo. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Member Cobert? Aye, Chair. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, let me uh, ask how many speakers we have. I think I have 20 cards with me. Do we have any um, callers on the line as well? Six callers. Six Se callers? Seven, sorry. Seven callers. Okay, so we have 20 speakers, seven callers. Um, before I 
before I go through the rather <laughs> regrettably lengthy instructions for um, public comments, let me just uh, speak with the board briefly. Uh, at the at last meeting, we had uh, several speakers that had concerns, and I think at the meeting, a couple of meetings before that, about giving their address um, here in a public forum. We have been doing this for, we went back and checked, uh, 30 years. Um, uh, I've been coming to these meetings as a private citizen and coming to county, county commission meetings for the same period of time. That's always been the practice. But we also know that just because we've always done something doesn't mean we always need to do it. Th our um, general counsel checked and found no uh, reason by our policy or by statute that we're required to ask for that information. I understand the concerns that have come from some members of our public. Um, we live in a different time, and I don't want anybody to come here and feel uncomfortable speaking. So if, it, if there's no objection from the board, what I was going to do was just uh, invite you uh, members of the public, if they want to give their name, they're free to give it. If they prefer not to, that's okay. I will tell you personally, it's helpful for me to hear the names because sometimes, um, remember Ms. Rosenthal, I'd gotten so many emails from her, and the first time I saw her, I could connect a name with a face. But I wanted to hear it from the board. So let me begin with Member uh, Felder on this issue. <coughs> okay, thank you, uh, Chairman Jacobs. I understand uh, about the addresses and so forth, but because we have, in, in past, we've been talking about some very significant issues, I think that we can at least get um, the city, because this is Orange County, uh, we, we can at least get it because there may be people who are from Butte, Montana, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, having some opinion, and then we're trying to deal with a vote. So they may not necessarily want to give the address, and I, you know, I understand that, but I would adhere that they should at least give us the name and the city. Uh, and that's just, those are my thoughts. Thank I you. I feel strongly about that. Thank uh, you. And let me, um, let me clarify one thing. We are still asking the public to fill out the speaker's card, which would include the name and the address. And the address can become particularly important um, when we're talking about, like, rezonings, for instance. It's helpful to know if the people who are speaking for or against are actually directed effe directly affected by a rezoning. So we'll still collect that data. Um, I believe that... Um, School Board Services is working on a way to get that information in front of each of you so that as somebody's speaking, you'll have access to know who they are, but it doesn't put them in the position of having to publicly put an address out there. So your suggestion about the county or the city, I think, is a, a, great, um, a great step. Hopefully, we'll have that in writing anyway and won't need to have somebody publicly state it. But let me hear from Member... I'll take input from the rest of you, and we'll move on. Member Gallo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree that in today's society and, and the climate that we're in, that it's, it's as a safety issue, we need to forego them giving their physical address. I do agree with Member Gel um, Felder that it would be nice if they would like to offer a first name, more importantly, the, the city that they reside in, whether it be Winter Park, Maitland, it's big enough that we, you know, for me personally, as a board member, when we're up here and we're listening to discussions, you know, we're making important decisions and, and I personally would like to know when they're at the mic if they if they're a constituent of mine and they represent my area because I want to make sure that I'm representing them as a board member and I won't know that if they don't give me their city so I would prefer to know and I know that we get we get um, stuff from board services but I'm looking at one that we got today and it, it has zip codes and I know most of my zip codes but Karen and I um, and even uh, Member Lopez and I and, and Castro Nitto, we, we share. We, we yeah. butt up against and we do sometimes share zip codes so that zip code won't really help, help at Understood. times. So just a city, not okay. not an address, but a city okay. when they're testifying, especially on, on issues such as masks, would be extremely helpful to me. Got Thank it. you. Thank you. Um, member um, Bird, Vice Chair. I, I was just about to say the same thing that Member Gallo said. I think it helps give context for us as board members to okay. know the city. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jenkins. That is for Member Cobert on the line. Ah, thank you. Member Cobert. Yes, good afternoon. I wholeheartedly concur. I love the suggestion by Member Felder that we get at least the name and the city. Um, that has more weight when it 
when they are our constituents or they are local citizens who are testifying before us. So I, I really like that suggestion and I concur that we are in a different time. Years ago, that might have been the only way to contact them, but as long as it is written on their, their card and we have a way to follow up, I'm good with that. Thank okay. you. All right, so what we will do beginning this meeting, um, kind, I would say pilot this, but for those of you who um, have indicated a desire to speak, if you would like to give your full name, we welcome that. If you would feel more comfortable giving your first name, we welcome that. If you are uncomfortable giving any name, that's fine as well. We would like to know the city um, that you live in. If you could provide that, that certainly doesn't give away your address or anything else. And um, we are, I believe, Dr. Jenkins, we are ready to move on to our first public hearing 3.01. I'm sorry, Member Kesterdenel. Pardon me? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't notice. Do, today we are still wearing masks. So if you're here in the chambers, our policy is still in effect. I know how much many of you do not like masks, and it probably goes beyond do not like masks. Um, I don't like masks. I don't think I feel as strongly as you all do. I can't stand them, but I don't feel as strongly. So please put your mask on when you're here. And um, until such time as the board makes a different decision about whether or not they're optional in the building, we'll keep them on. Thank you very much. And I should mention, because um, we're going to start taking public comment in a couple minutes, those of you may, who may not have been here with us, we do have a, full, a few rules that we follow. We very much value hearing from the public. We do ask that we're all respectful of each other in the meeting, that we honor our, our code of civility. That primarily means that if somebody is speaking, even if you're in favor, no cheers, no boos, no hisses, no verbal outcries. If you wish to express support for what somebody is saying, you can raise your hand, you can give us a thumbs up. If you're opposed, you can give us a thumbs down. Again, we want your feedback, but we don't want it to be disruptive to the meeting or disrespectful to the speaker. So with that said, um, I will say that we've had tremendous success. I know people are passionate on this subject on both sides. We respect everyone's opinion and we're glad that you're here and we look forward to a very cordial meeting. Um, with that, Dr. Jenkins, I'm gonna turn to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is our final public hearing for policy EBBA, disease prevention, colon face coverings. It was brought uh, initially on June 2nd, notification to CTA on May 26th, a publication date of May 30th, rule development workshop on June 17th, and now the final school board meeting on July 13th. For those listening or curious, that is why uh, we have to follow certain guidelines for rulemaking, and we have met those requirements. I'd like to also mention, and the, po and the policy has been published since our last uh, uh, rule development workshop and available for all to review. I'd like to just make a couple of comments as well. We are four weeks from the start of school. It's, it's hard to even say that. We are four weeks from the start of school. I wanna reassure uh, the general public that nothing in this new policy um, uh, prohibits the school board from taking any emergency action should they have a need to in the future. Additionally, the provisions for the superintendent are limited to mandates from external resources, that is mandates, not recommendations. Thirdly, we will certainly continue to monitor the situation over the next four weeks with Dr. Pino and our um, health department, as well as with our own Mayor Demings. Uh, we also have the ability, should the board approve this, to add a statement on behalf of the board that in light of the CDC guidance, School Board of OCPS does recommend that parents of children not yet uh, not vaccinated for COVID-19 have their child uh, consider having their child use a face covering at school and on the bus. That being said, Madam Chair, we bring the policy forward for final approval. All right, thank you. Any presentation from staff or we're gonna go straight to public comment? All right, I know we have done that. Um, so let's hear from our first public speaker and let me welcome Leslie Hodge to the, to the mic. Welcome. Well, hello, Madam Chair and uh, school board members and county staff and Super Superintendent Jenkins. It's good to see you again. Uh, my name is Wesley Hodge. I live at 2826 Fitzsooth Drive, which is in Winter Park, Florida. Uh, Ms. Gallo, it's in your district. Uh, and I also serve as the chairman of the Orange County Democratic Party. And it is my pleasure to be here today um, 
I actually would like to see a mandatory mask mandate, but I believe that this optional one is, is at least a, a step in the right direction. Uh, you know, pride is thinking that you know better than doctors or uh, professionals in the medical field. Uh, pride is thinking that you are more important than your neighbor. Pride is something that severs the soul from grace. Grace and compassion for our fellow human beings is what makes us a great uh, you know, species here. This is not an object of tyranny. This is not something that is meant to suppress you. This is not something that is designed to take away your freedom. This is one of the tools that we have to protect ourselves from a disease that is spreading around the globe. Doctors and nurses have been wearing these for many, many years with no ill effects to protect their patients. We need to do this temporarily to protect ourselves from a global pandemic. Nobody's trying to infringe upon anybody else's rights. And the, the people that are speaking against this, I try to see their point of view and I just can't. I really have tried. And so I wanna say thank you all because you have dealt with something that has never been dealt with before by a school board and have done a tremendous job. And our teachers and our students have had to adapt and do the best that they could. And you all have done a great job. So I wanted to be here to just say thank you. I know that you're not gonna get a whole lot of support <laughs> with the decision today, um, whichever way you all decide. But please know that um, we appreciate your hard work and service to our community. And I hope that uh, you will at least keep this as optional, if not revisit it and make it mandatory. So thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, let's take our next speaker, Rita Harris. Oh, I just realized, shoot, I'm sorry. I'm gonna read numbers and you guys are gonna decide on names. Okay. Number two, it feels rather. That's fine, I was gonna give my name. Okay. <laughs> so that's okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Rita Harris. I live in Orlando, Florida, 32837. I am in board member two's district. Um, I am a product of the public school uh, system myself, and I appreciate all the work um, that gets put into educating our children. Um, when I was young, and I could be dating myself a little bit here, um, my teachers taught me how to read, and they taught me how to write, and they taught me how to do math. Um, they also taught me something called the golden rule. And that was you do unto others as you would like to have done unto you, right? So I know there's a lot of talk about how these masks don't really protect us anyway. I, 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 I saw the last uh, board meeting. And um, yeah, you know, that's true. Even when a doctor wears a mask like this, he's, um, he's protecting his patient from his own germs. And that's what I'm doing right now. When I wear my mask, I'm saying to everybody in this room, you know what? I care about you, I care about your health, I want you to stay healthy, I want you to see another day, I want you to hug your children, I want you to see another sunrise, I want you to see another sunset, right? And that is what I would like for the board to take into this consideration, that it's, it's a learning opportunity, everyone's talking about the, the, the impact it has on children, children are resilient, and what they're gonna get out of this is that they're gonna learn how to take care of each other they're going to learn how to take care of themselves, and they're going to learn how to be a part of a community. And that's a lesson that everybody needs to learn, everybody should grow up with. So I hope that as you move forward, um, thinking about how to handle this, you will take into consideration that it is a way to teach our kids more than just the fundamentals. It's a way to teach them how to care. And thank you. Thank you. Let's take speaker number three. Yes, my name is Jennifer Dotson. I reside at 4626 Bunting, B-U-N-T-I-N-G Avenue, Orlando, Florida, 32802. Myself and my son are both alumni from Boone High School. Linda Cobert is my representative. Hello again. My name is Jennifer Dotson, and I'm here to discuss the issues of masks used to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Many will come here to say masks are abusive. Children can't communicate or learn without masks. This is patently false. As a parent, aunt, great aunt to multiple children from all age groups and friend to other parents of children of all ages, children in general have no problems with masks if their parents don't make it a problem. The last year has been a roller coaster for all. 
Early in the pandemic, we were offered a set of facts. As the research into this virus has evolved, those responsible for public information realize the error of much of that early advice. Now we know that it's primarily spread indoors in enclosed spaces. We also know that masks are used in two ways to stop the asymptomatic spread of COVID. First, by slowing the spread of large aerosolized drops, which become smaller drops. It also slows down the contact from those drops coming into your own mouth. We must move away from this mantra of my immune system will protect me. Nearly everyone has either been personally affected by COVID or knows someone who has lost their life or suffers from long-term after effects. I just lost my best friend of almost 30 years. He leaves behind a wife and two 13-year-old daughters. Now in July, over a year after the start, positivity rates have now more than doubled in the last three weeks. New variants require less time to infect people and cases here in Florida, specifically Orange County, are climbing exponentially. We will never get through this with this level of animosity and miseducation that's being shared. So I leave you with this. In the words of Oscar Wilde, selfishness is not living as one wishes to live. It is asking others to live as one wishes to live. Those wishing to continue masking to vote down this rule will be viewed as selfish by those against masks. And I can accept that. I would much rather stand on the right side of history. I would much rather give my child the lesson that thinking of others is the right thing to do than to be viewed as one who helps spread a virus that has already taken over the lives of over 600,000 people in America and affected countless more millions of lives. I hope that you all will choose to be on the right side of history, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, and help us get through this and out to the other side. And I would also like to thank each and every one of you for your job that you do here. I also witnessed the last meeting that was held, and I would never in a million years have the patience that you guys have to be able to endure that. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, and especially a huge thank you to my district member, Linda Cobert. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dodson. All right, let's take speaker number four. Hello, everybody. I believe I'm speaker number four. Um, I think so, too, <laughs> but uh, I won't is, know for sure. I, my name is Theodore Roosevelt you Quarles are. III, uh, a name that I proudly wear and uh, cherish in this uh, time and age. Uh, yeah. I am a teacher for OCPS. I'm an ESE teacher. Um, I reside at uh, here in, obviously, Orlando, 32829. I don't know whose district that is or um, area that is. Um, but uh, I just want to give a, a statement about my own children. You know, I choose to put my children in a uh, private Christian school. And last year, there was no mask mandate at all. It was freely open. And outside of a few cases of COVID-19, there was no significant event all year long. My children learned freely, happily, seeing smiles, not having to rely on smizing or just looking at the eyes, learning that social emotional learning that we strive by looking at uh, facial expressions. Uh, it was just, it was, it was eye opening to, to work in that environment and to see such a free environment of kids learning. Um, you probably heard a lot about different statistics um, about the recent Gainesville, uh, Florida study about the pathogens and the bacteria and fungi uh, that these masks are like breeding grounds were damp, moist, warm environments. And you're, you're breathing in these what they call volatile organic compounds. And you're actually breathing them in deeper into your lungs, causing um, more harm than good, I would say. Uh, you know, bacterial pneumonia, staph infections of the face. I mean, it's the things I've seen and heard is just uh, appalling. Um, I do applaud um, what you are doing here today and trying to make it optional. Um, so I do hope you move in that direction. Uh, I do have concerns about possible what vaccine mask right segregation of your, if you're vaxxed, no mask. If you're unvaxxed, you have to wear a mask. I mean, that, that's clearly um, unequal and segregated. So um, that's just my, my stance, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. And thank you for teaching. All right. 
let's hear from speaker number. You know what? This has silver linings. I don't have to worry about how to pronounce this or, in some cases, how to read your writing. But in this case, I have no problem reading the writing. It's speaking, speaker number five. Thank you very much, Chair Jacobs. Um, I know you know how to say my name. My name is Judy Hayes. Um, I am a parent of two children who are currently enrolled in Orange County Public Schools. I live in um, member Coberts district. She is also a parent of children who went to the same schools as mine. Um, I am also a former OCPS student. My student number has the year 1978 in it. <laughs> so I've been here for quite a while. Um, thank you all for your service. We really appreciate um, I understand how difficult and how unprecedented this year has been. I know unprecedented is one of those words that we're not supposed to use, um, but here we are. So um, it just in terms of making masks optional for those who are vaccinated, I think that it's clear to see from observing this board meeting, the last board meeting, literally all of them for the last year, that we simply cannot rely on a large percentage of the population to adhere to the honor system and to wear a mask if they're unvaccinated. Because if you look around, everybody who's got their thumbs down now, they don't want to wear a mask and they're not going to. And we can't force them and I understand that. But at this point, we know that 100% of students under the age of 12 are unvaccinated and they're gonna come to school and some of them are not going to wear masks because their parents haven't done their jobs and their parents haven't impressed upon them how important it is to protect your neighbor. Hey, guess what? You have to wash the masks and if you wash them or you wear disposable masks, then you don't have to worry about a staph infection. That's ridiculous. It's like washing your hands. These are our jobs as parents and we need to impress that upon our children. If we can't do that, then we have failed as parents. So to the extent that OCPS, I get it, I understand we can make a reasonable compromise. We're not gonna wear masks forever, but we don't need to decide forever right now. And right now, we know that elementary age students are almost all unvaccinated. And if we give them the option of wearing masks or not, then the parents who don't wanna do their jobs aren't going to do their jobs. And it's going to imperil our children and it's going to force children with disabilities back into the shadows. They're not going to be able to come to school. They're going to be deprived of their free and appropriate public education sheerly through human failure. So to the extent that OCPS can make an allowance to overcome that human failure that we see on display here with their signs and their t-shirts, I would just implore OCPS to think of our children and to do what's right. We don't have to do it forever. But for the time being, unless and until children can get vaccinated, we need to maintain a mask mandate for elementary age children. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, let's take speaker number six. Hello. Welcome. I'm Diana and I live in Winter Park, Florida. I have two children that attend OCPS schools. Um, I attended the last board meeting where the vast majority of people here spoke against the policy of forced masks and gave a plethora of facts, data, studies, and personal experiences regarding the negative impact of forced masking on our children this past school year. In April, the Commissioner of Education here in Florida, Richard Corcoran, sent a letter to all the Florida superintendents saying, and I quote, the data shows us that district face covering policies do not impact the spread of the virus. He also stated face coverings are a personal decision and such policies may also impede instruction and I couldn't agree with him more on that. One of your main responsibilities as our school board is to ensure that students get the best education for our tax dollars spent. Students being forced to unnaturally cover their faces all day, being taught by teachers who cover their faces are not getting the best education nor being taught in the best learning environment. Let's be clear and honest about this. Masks are an impediment to students' learning. I don't think there is even one study claiming that masks boost student learning or enhance social growth or mental growth because we all know that would be ridiculous. In the last meeting, we cited plenty of data and personal experiences detailing how masks have hurt the mental and social health of our kids as well as their academic growth, especially those with learning disabilities and differences. Masks are a stumbling block to our students in school. If one of your main responsibilities is to ensure the best learning environment for our kids, then forced masks should never be part of our school protocol ever again. 
Um, I do have to touch upon something that was said by a board member at the last meeting. Um, one of you said that personally you would want masks to be mandated for young children that could not get the COVID vaccine. Um, your statement really scared me and many other parents because that assumes that this experimental vaccine is a clear and definite positive thing for all students. And I have just a sampling here of recent headlines um, that show a dramatically and disturbing um, you know, thing that we should all be aware of. I mean, children, um, it, this, it shows that young people have died and have suffered major health injuries as a result of getting the experimental COVID vaccine. Um, the latest CDC VAERS data shows over 11,000 injuries in young people ages 12 to 17 following their COVID vaccine. So this should give you pause to encourage it or include it as part of any broad decisions concerning masks and our children. Um, I have another, I'm, very, I'm a visual learner, so bear with me on my graphics here. Um, this is ultimately a very easy decision um, for you to make when you realize that you can accommodate both sides of the debate by just always making masks optional and removing section B. Section B presents a loophole that could revert back to mask mandates on our kids in school without our consent. The only way to truly represent our community is to remove Section B so masks always remain optional. We want all medical decisions, including masks and vaccines, to be in the hands of the parents only. When you turn personal medical decisions into broad force mandates, you divide and silence a huge part your time is up. Thank of you. our community that you're serving. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take speaker number seven. Um, I'm Isabel S. I am a resident of Orlando. I live in Orange County. I have three school-aged children who are worth a minimum of $30,000 to your school system. I'm a former nanotech research scientist who has worked in clean rooms. I have been thoroughly trained in PPE. The clean rooms I worked in are cleaner than any operating theater and have extra oxygen pumped in to make breathing easier in our masks that we changed every 30 to 45 minutes to keep the bacteria from building up. I personally get a severe headache in my forehead area whenever I have to wear this cotton mask. Viruses are also measured in nanometers, and I guarantee you that they are much smaller than the weave in cotton masks and even in disposable masks, which have a disclaimer that they can't protect you from a virus, and that disclaimer is located on the box. I have completely given up on the public school system in this country. I cannot force my children to go against their own desire to learn without headaches and bacteria being inhaled. My children will not be attending your schools and you will lose a minimum of $30,000 that they are worth to you. A lot of parents I have spoken with have expressed that they cannot find a way to fire your schools and get them out of their lives. I want to encourage other parents to get together and use their power and creativity to come up with another solution for their family that allows their children to be themselves and to grow into their life's purpose. We humans have a superpower called personal choice. It's time for us to use that power and become the master of our own fate and the captain of our own souls. All right, number eight, speaker number eight. Good evening, Chair and Board. Thank you for having this open forum for us. Um, <clears throat> I was here last meeting, um, and it was a, a, it was an experience to say the least. Um, what I'd like to speak to today about is basically the masks as far as choice. Um, I think that's a, an important word um, as far as choices, um, solid choices in the sense of when you have a mask on, we're not saying that if you want a mask, not to wear a mask. Um, that's their personal choice. Uh, however, if we feel as parents that based on our understanding and, and, and our research that we've done, that it's not fruitful for their learning and their overall development down the road. And I mentioned last meeting about the psychology of it. <clears throat> not enough times that we look at the psychology of what it's doing for the children with their mask on, not being able to see the faces of others, the smiles, the inflection of their face and things of that nature, being able to run and play 
and freely without having some con constraint on their, f on their face. Um, I'm not going to go into the specifics of um, the, the details, if you will, of statistics of whether they're what masks are. Uh, clearly, the box says it doesn't do anything as far as holding back viruses. It's, I, I, I believe that it's something that it should be a choice, bottom line. And I don't want to waste any more time with it. But I just hope that you, got, you all uh, take that into account when you make your choice and just give us parents the, the option uh, to do what's right for our children and not to mandate something that is ultimately going to impact everybody right or wrong. So options are good. Choices are, are, are what we look are looking for. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. All right. Speaker number nine. Good afternoon. Jeanette Wise, Orlando. Per the CDC, if you are between the ages of zero and 70, your COVID-19 survival rate is nearly 95% with a higher survival rate for our children. While this information is a relief for many, some doctors are extremely worried, hoping that precautions are still taken, which seem to be all that mainstream media interviews. Where's the other side? The CDC has also provided recommendations, which are just that, recommendations, a suggestion, advice, or a proposal that one can choose to follow or not. The CDC does not make laws and does not supersede the Constitution. Folks are using these bits as shields to behave erratically, often with the added verbiage erring on the side of caution. Enough already. Human life is about self-assessment and a chosen balance of risk and caution, never an extreme of either when offered as a guideline for society. Each individual must do a risk-benefit analysis with all the information. The entire human population has never needed to be under the thumb of an alarmist extremist and overreach. The last public session saw a few extremist perspectives from parents citing their children's at-risk status. I can't speak for every single case, but those of us here wanting the mask to no longer be in place at all substantially include those children as well. I say this with personal experience from family and friends of Down syndrome, autism, and more. Report after report after report, which I have several, and I can share them, but your emails are always inundated, and though I appreciate responses, you can't possibly read everything. Uh, the key factor for those at risk of more severe reaction to COVID-19 is obesity. And even with this component having been identified very early, folks are still trying to push a vaccine for all when all this type of illness is, which is similar to the flu in many ways, has never been needed by all, only by those that are at a greater risk for negative response to the actual virus. And I'm sorry, but any virus that is darn close to 100% range of full recovery is not an at-risk option that needs a vaccine. Masks have been proven ineffective, period, dot, end of story. It's true, and it's as simple as that. There is no need to use this as some back pocket line of defense should some perceived health issue be on the horizon. Isolation and shutting down the world has also been proven ineffective. The new Delta variant and any other variant that comes along needs to run its course just like every flu and coronavirus before 2019. Each have been around for centuries. The only thing different with COVID-19 from years past was the severe manipulation of what the media selected to communicate to us. Proper prophylactic use of vitamin D and zinc also have been proven as an effective defense against COVID-19, never mind their general health benefits overall. Again, <laughs> yeah. as I said in the last public session, many are waiting for somebody else to step up and do the right thing. You are who that is in this case. Return to treating us as the healthy people that as a whole we generally are. Reground us in common sense and logic. Please stop creating solutions for problems that don't exist. Stop being afraid of what could go wrong and start being excited for about what could go right. We are also here to speak against part B of the proposed amendment of shifting authority to the superintendent with sole decision making capacity. While I believe Dr. Jenkins has been super awesome in her role, she will not be there forever. And therefore part B should not be in place for unknown successors. Thank you. Thank you. Before I uh, call on the next speaker, I want to recognize all of you that are wearing your mask, and I thank you for that. We do have a couple of individuals that are not, and I'm going to ask again politely, please put your mask on and keep them on. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from speaker number 10. Hi, my name is Laurel DeWild. I live in Orlando, Florida, and I'm a 15-year resident here. I'm a parent and a small business owner as well as um, I run a Facebook group, about 1,100 people um, that reside mostly in Orange County, and we want to end the mask mandate. 
Um, basically, our community is moving forward. Big box stores are moving forward. You don't, it's mass optional. Schools are even moving mass optional. Seminole County, Volusia County, or just to name a few, a couple. Um, and lots of private schools, both in Seminole, Orange County. Um, entertainment, movie theaters. The last couple weeks, I haven't had to wear a mask anywhere. It's been optional. Even at SeaWorld, it's optional. So I feel like we're moving forward. You know, Don't be that board that doesn't move forward. Don't move backwards. The other thing I want to mention is that um, I live in a community that's very involved in their schools, and the parents want back on campus. So I just want to touch on that. Please resume that. It's instrumental in fundraising and bringing quality education back to the schools. Thank you. All right, another benefit is, you probably know your order now, number 11. I think I'm 11, but I didn't really pay attention. So. Oh, there are two numbers, 11s? Oh, maybe I'm not. Maybe That's I'm not. okay. <laughs> That's, it doesn't, you know what, Who, it, it's not a big deal. Whoever wants to go first, okay? Is it, is it April, the number 11? Yeah, it is okay. April. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> uh, my name's April, I live in Maitland. And um, I just want to go through some research. A recent study at the University of Louisville showed that masks did not slow the spread of COVID-19. Another study in the JAMA Pediatrics showed that masks are detrimental to our children. The normal content of CO2 in an open room is 400 ppm. Levels in a closed room are 2,000 ppm. Anything beyond that is unacceptable. A study of 25,000 children showed that after wearing a mask for only three minutes, the child with the lowest carbon dioxide level was three times greater than the acceptable limit, and that the youngest children had the greatest level with the seven-year-old's level at 25,000 ppm. What happens when you breathe a high level of CO2? High CO2 levels in the blood can lead to difficulty concentrating, headaches, fatigue, dizziness, and more. A study in the American Institute of Economic Research shows that 26,000 children showed that wearing masks for 270 minutes a day resulted in irritability in 66%, headache in 53%, difficulty concentrating 50%, less happiness 49%, reluctance to go to school 44%, impaired learning 38%, and fatigue 37%. Did you know that the CDC, CDC stated that 94% of all COVID deaths in the U.S. had underlying medical conditions such as diabetes and heart disease? They died with COVID, not from COVID. 9,683 people died from COVID. Most people, why did they continue to create fear in children for a virus that has a 99.98% survival rate? We all know that masks are a gateway to the vaccine. If we get rid of the mask, there'll be no incentive for you to ever get the vaccine. Be aware that this vaccine is in clinical trials until the year 2023. A 12-year-old Maggie is in the clinical trials right now. Well, she was until she ended up being paralyzed in a wheelchair and had to use a feeding tube due to gastrointestinal issues from the vaccine. But of course, the experts said there was no way that was from the vaccine. A recent article in Newsweek said a 13-year-old died in their sleep after receiving the Pfizer vaccine, but again, this was a total coincidence. I did my own research on the CDC's VAERS system and found 12 more deaths due to COVID-19 vaccine in children ages 12 to 18. The media wants you to believe that masks will keep you safe and the vaccine is going to give you your life back. But did you know that a recent study published in Public Health England showed that 63% of deaths due to the Delta variant were in vaccinated individuals and 72% of those who died were fully vaccinated. But still the study encourages you to go ahead and get your vaccine. Did you know that over 1,000 lawyers and 10,000 doctors are actively suing the CDC for crimes against humanity? This madness has got to stop. The masks are nothing more than a gateway to the vaccine, keeping everyone in fear. I refuse to live in fear, and I to teach my children to grow up fearful. Again, for a cold virus with a 99.98% survival rate. Thank you. I believe I'm number 12. I can't. Okay, go ahead. Um, my name is Jessica Tillman. Um, I am actually a Seminole County resident, but we have removed our mask policy, and I'm here to support these parents. And because what you guys do in Orange County does affect us in Seminole County, we, I know we look at what you guys do. So 
My name is Jessica Tillman and I am a Seminole County resident. I am here in support of all these parents to and to ensure that they get their parental rights back. There is no proof, data, and research stating masks stop viral spread. There is a difference between droplets and viral spread. The state of Florida, as of July 1st, has put into place the Parents' Bill of Rights, which your mask policy now violates. The definition of medical freedom is the right to choose the care one receives for their own body. Ethics is the well-founded sta standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligations, benefits to society, fairness, and spe or specific virtues. Your own ethics policy states, the school board is committed to con conducting business in an ethical, open, and transparent manner so that the citizens of Cit Orange County can have the utmost confidence in the district. Your mask policy is not ethical and does not give Orange County citizens confidence in this district. Informed consent is a process for getting permission before conducting a health care intervention on a person. Masks are a medical device and vaccines are an invasive medical procedure. Your policy does not allow for informed consent, nor does your continued push to vaccinate all students. Neglect is, the, is to pay little to no attention to fail, to fail to heed or disregard. The very definition of the, your behavior to these parents and their children for more than a year now. You also need to tell your teachers to stop asking vaccinated students to raise their hand. It is none of their business. You are holding these children hostage to a mask, pushing them into getting an emergency use authorized use only uh, gene therapy. It is not approved by the FDA. The governor stated again today and the commissioner of the Florida Department of Education have both said school should be normal next year. The commissioner sent you a letter stating there was no difference in cases in districts with or without mandates, also stating masks do not impact viral spread. There were many districts and private schools that never had mandates and did just as well. Many schools and districts have already stated masks will be optional next year. Orange County Public Schools needs to stop with their tyranny and allow parents to parent their children. Let's get back to parents parenting and teachers teaching. We are done with these masks. Following the corrupt CDC guidelines to ma mask children for more than a year now, five days a week for over eight hours with no proof that they stopped viral spread and harm them mentally and physically is not okay. I promise you any district in this state that tries to push masks on our children any longer or ever again will have a lawsuit on their hands. These are our children, not yours. Number 13. And I'm concerned about the woman who started to speak. Have we skipped over you? Um, no, we're okay? What number are you? I have no idea. Is it Misty? <laughs> Pardon me? Misty for 13. You're, you're yeah, but. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure I wasn't jumping in okay, front. Okay, I know. I'm <laughs> Can I pull this down? I want down? to try to figure this out. Um, go Can ahead. I pull this down? <laughs> oh, please pull it down. Yes, we won't be able to hear you otherwise. Thank yeah. you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Misty Griffin. I'm a mom of three amazing boys, 11, 14, and 17 one of whom spoke to you at the last meeting. He was a little guy who wants to see his teacher's faces. Thank you for letting us share our voice with you. I would like to encourage you to please vote to make the mask optional for the 21-22 school year. I have one son who has asthma and had asthma attacks every single day from February until school was out. Everything we tried did not help. He was on extra medicine, but it didn't make a difference. His pediatrician said it's because of the mask. We are now monitoring for long-term lung damage. I also have another son who is a singer and is entering his senior year and benefits from the amazing arts program that we have here in OCPS. However, at the end of the school year, we started noticing issues with his lungs and throat. The mask was causing him to breathe in his bacteria and was causing damage. The research on this does not look good and he may be looking at irreparable damage. This would be devastating as he has big dreams to use his musical voice someday. One of my sons got a urinary tract infection, which has never happened before. The testing of the mask that was done at the University of Florida showed that the 11 dangerous pathogens found in the masks that were tested included urinary tract infections, as well as pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis, sepsis, diphtheria, and Lyme disease. I understand that there are many parents who do not want their children, who do want their children to wear a mask, excuse me, and I respect that. I am asking you to please understand and acknowledge that while the mask may help their child, it's hurting mine. I brought a new box of masks here and I have them with me if you want to see. There is a warning on the side that says that they do not stop virus spread. We cannot ignore the full science. 
When the mask mandate was put into place, we didn't know much about COVID. Now we do. We know that children are at low risk. We know, we know that those are at risk are able to get a vaccination if they choose. We know that a teacher does not need to be afraid of her students. And we know doctors know the proper treatment for the virus and are doing so in our local hospitals. I know because my husband is one of them. We know that the hospitals are nowhere near reaching capacity and the treatment is readily available. We know that the masks do not work to stop the spread of the virus. And we know that damage is being done to students who cannot or do not need to wear a mask. I ask that you please consider all the students, not just a few, when casting your vote today. Thank you. All right, number, thir number 14, I'm sorry, number 14. Madam Chair, I believe that's your next speaker. <laughs> the lady who we had skipped before, yes ma'am. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'm so perplexed. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Robin Rose, um, and I live in Apopka, and um, get my paper ready. Part 1B of the draft you are voting today states that the superintendent can implement new requirements if updates are issued by the CDC or other governmental entities, which is quite vague. Which governmental entities will you choose to listen to, and how will you base that decision is my concern. The CDC just updated their policies on July 9th, so where does that leave us? The updated policy by the CDC is a detailed program of discrimination against kids based on their individual vaccination status. Will you be coercing children to get shots in order to avoid mask wearing, even if they have natural immunity or medical risk factors? This needs to be clearly defined. Will you listen to Governor DeSantis, who just today said no mandates? Yet, Mayor Demings is talking about increasing masks again. Perhaps Orange County elected officials might all listen to the Florida for Court of Appeals, in which the first district recently ruled against mask mandates, citing that they violate our constitutional rights. Under the first district, local and state government entities can no longer legally require face masks, even if people are not vaccinated, including schools. If they persist, they will be in defiance of the law. Although Orange County may not be under the first district, this has a precedent. According to the lawyer who won the case, an outcome of this ruling is that if you reinstate a mask mandate of any sort, you will now have to provide the evidence that masks work to support your claims, which cannot be done because true scientific data has never shown that masks work for SARS-CoV-2. Therefore, you will be violating laws of our state constitution. Remember that constitution? Several of you discussed teaching moments to learn about democracy which I found ironic after being bullied into following arbitrary rules made up here. Democracy is not power over the people. The Constitution outlines clearly that our rights are not granted by government. Rather, the role of our elected officials is to guard our God-given rights. It also professes that it's not just the right, but the duty of a responsible citizen to stand up peacefully against unjust government overreach. You as a school board have no legal right to tell me what to do with my body or that of my child, nor does the CDC. If you choose to follow CDC recommendations, as mentioned, you might want to consider that several lawsuits are in process against the CDC, including one for violating all 10 Nuremberg Codes. You should recall that the Nuremberg Codes were enacted after unspeakable, unspeakable crimes against humanity were performed under the guise of public health. A key component is that no one may be coerced to participate in medical experiments. Consent is absolutely essential. Masks for COVID are defined as experimental, which requires that we give consent. We have the right to refuse. Do you want to be held liable for your participation in violating laws of ethical medicine? The governing entity you should be listening to is the group of the constituents Rose, you serve. Ms. Rose, your We, time the is parents, up. are the experts who know what's best for our children. Number 15. Uh, hello. I am from Orlando, Florida, 32807. Hello, my name is Olaya Lopez. I am going to fourth grade, and in my third grade, I had experience wearing a mask, and I don't like it. 
I think this is child abuse because the school is not respecting me and my family's rights. I understand you want us to be healthy, but seriously, masks and PE class, somebody can faint. I have sometimes feel that I am about to. Masks are not good for us, so please make masks optional. Just the fact that I have to wear this mask right now in order for me to speak out my rights makes me sick. Thank you all. Thank you, and God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you, and God bless you, too. Okay, number, uh, and great job, young lady. <laughs> number 16, with your public speaking. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hills. I live in 32806. I am in District 6. And I'm here because my son is a rising second grader who had a very successful year attending school via launch ed. Despite his good ex experience, we feel that it's time for him to join his classmates in person for the upcoming school year. That being said, my husband and I are still greatly concerned about potential COVID-19 infection risk. OCPS mitigated transmission rates exceptionally well last school year. This is mainly due to the diligent mask wearing by the OCPS community. With the highly transmittable Delta variant present in our community, it would be wholly irresponsible to, be, to completely drop the mask mandate at this time. Cases are on the rise. Mayor Demings just yesterday changed his recommendation and all people, whether vaccinated or not, should be wearing masks even inside. The CDC still recommends that masks be worn indoors by all individuals aged two and older who are not fully vaccinated. This is already at odds with Rule B being presented here today. Additionally, the American Academy of Pediatrics also recommends that masking continue for all children ages two and up. I know that receiving the vaccination is a personal choice that every family must make for themselves but I feel that it would be irresponsible for the mask mandate to be dropped prior to the vaccine being available to all age groups. Please let families have a chance to vaccinate their younger children before the mask mandate is completely lifted. Masking should, should remain mandatory for all children, but especially for those who have not yet had an opportunity to be fully vaccinated. Additionally, no child should have to feel singled out for wearing a mask nor should they have to feel anxious about contracting the virus because others aren't masking. Children are deserving of protection without any added social implications. We know that masking works. We know that masks work to protect others. The science works and we know that because of last year's successful school year. Please help us protect our children. Please keep the mask mandate in place for at least the children who are not yet eligible to receive the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Number 17. Yes, 17, yes. Hello again, my name is Ashley Rosenthal and I live in Orlando, Florida with three children in Orange County Public Schools. The first speaker today said, mandating masks, this isn't something designed to take away your freedom. He is absolutely incorrect. The right of privacy is a fundamental one, expressly protected by the Florida Constitution, and any law that implicates it is presumptively unconstitutional, such that it must be subject to strict scrutiny and justified as the least restrictive means to serve a compelling governmental interest. The right to be let alone by government does exist in Florida as part of a right of privacy that our Supreme Court has declared to be fundamental. The Florida Supreme Court has construed this fundamental right to be so broad as to include the complete freedom of a person to control his own body. Under this construction, a person can reasonably expect not to be forced by the government to put something on his own face against his will. So yes, mandatory mask policies absolutely are designed to take away an individual's freedom. I will be generous and simply state that there is conflicting information out there. Don't wear a mask for three months, then wear a mask. Ivermectin absolutely doesn't work. Maybe ivermectin works. 
you can quibble about questions, not quibble, but you can debate questions of, well, if someone else is vaccinated, why does it matter if I'm vaccinated or not? And if masks work and you're wearing a mask, why does it matter if I'm wearing a mask? And there are people to speak on every angle of those questions. That reasonable debate is why masks need to be optional. The decision to put a mask covering the nose and mouth of a young child should be the decision of a parent, not the state. And you do not currently have a compelling state interest to justify continuing to mask children. And I do believe that we're here, based upon the consensus that was reached last month, that you understand that making masks optional is critical for Orange County Public Schools. So I want to address Part B of the draft proposal. And the superintendent had some comments at the very beginning of this meeting that um, were comforting to hear in that I believe she reflected the intent is that this is in the event of an emergency and is only to follow mandates, not guidance. However, that is not the way Part B is written as drafted. I understand that changes to the language of Part B can't be made today in order for it to be implemented, but that language needs to be revised to reflect the intent. Um, I don't believe that the board intended to pass the buck and have no involvement in any decision if the Delta variant, which people can debate, if the Delta variant becomes virulent and there's tons of children in the hospital and the superintendent has to act, I don't believe that the school board wants the superintendent to have carte blanche authority to make whatever decisions. You didn't intend that for the exception to swallow the rule, and that's why Part B needs to be revised in the event that you approve this rule today. Thanks, Mr. Rosenthal. All right, number 18. Hi, my name is Eric Grimmer and I'm a resident here in Orlando, zip code 32828. As I thought about what I would say at today's meeting about one of the most important issues of our, of our time, as an attorney, I try to anticipate the arguments an opposing party might make and prepare responses to them. So I thought, what is the debate here today? Is it, do masks work? No, we know they do. The data and the science tells us they do. Masking helps spread, stop the spread of this deadly disease. Is it, do vaccines work? No, we know they do. Getting a vaccine is safe, it is free, it provides substantial protection against infection from COVID-19 and near universal protection against hospitalization and death. Is it, can everyone who wants a vaccine get one at this time? No, many of our children, including two of my own, one who starts kindergarten this year, are not currently able to protect themselves with a vaccine. They need us, their parents and fellow community members to protect them. Is it, has everyone who is eligible for vaccine gotten one? No, the vaccination rate in our state and country have stagnated and infections have exploded, especially in the age 18 to 34 age bracket, which includes high schoolers. We've seen what happened in the past few weeks when eligible citizens do not get vaccines or follow effective mitigation strategies. Cases are quickly on the rise. The local positivity rate has nearly doubled in the past week. Nearly everyone who is being hospitalized or dying from COVID-19 has not been vaccinated. My kids have not been vaccinated. They can't be. Is it do masks infringe upon our freedoms? Only if your conception of freedom means you think you get to do whatever you want. You don't and I don't. We are a nation of laws that we have a responsibility to follow. I look around and I see masks and signs that demand their freedom back and that masks their tyranny. I look around and I don't know, everyone looks pretty free to me. It's 5 p.m. on a Tuesday and we're all at a school board meeting. I would ask anyone who considers wearing a mask to be tyranny to consult any history book for a true definition of tyranny. I also see a lot of thumbs up and downs in response to the public comments. In ancient Roman times, a thumbs up, thumbs down from the crown meant a gladiator should die, and thumbs down from the emperor sealed the gladiator's fate. 
a thumbs down here means I don't agree with you. That's it. We're all still free. This isn't tyranny. Do I like wearing a mask? Not particularly, but the cost of wearing a mask, my minor annoyance, is far outweighed by the vast benefit of protecting the most vulnerable members of our population and our children. We are supposed to be a United States, a nation of 50 states, and even more local a collection of communities. We're supposed to look out for each other. I believe a mask I can look out for you and your children. I only ask you to look out for mine. A free country does not mean freedom from all responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grimmer. All right, number 19. Number 19, it still feels very weird to call people by numbers. Um, Luz? Luz, are you here? Okay. Uh, number 20? Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Lacey. I am in the 32806 um, zip code. And my point of view is very simple. Um, first off, I want to thank you all for doing all this hard work. I know it's super hard to hear <laughs> all of these um, very strong mass debates. Um, and I really want to thank you for the opportunity to state my position in this whole deal. My son is in elementary school, and I want f to have the right and the option to choose to mask my child um, for the upcoming school year. There are people who are scared, and they can choose to mask their families, and I believe that they absolutely should have the right to do that. Um, but I also should have the right not to mask my child if I choose. Um, please, I ask you to support the rights of the parents who wish to choose for their children. I know, I and only I know what my child needs to develop and grow, and I feel like we should have that right. Um, that is all I have to say. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, one more try for Luce, number 19. Let's go to our callers. And um, Ms. Enville, how many callers do we have? Eight? Okay, thank you. Seven, thank you. All right, let's take our first caller. Our first caller is Tara Riley. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'd like to say first, there's a lot of great speakers today. I appreciate everyone's points of views and opinions. My name is Tara, and I live in Orlando, 32836. I would like to open my comments up by pointing out on this very meeting's document, the pre-agenda public comment period protocol. The note at the bottom has a statement of guidance from Chancellor of Education, Jacob Oliva, issued on May 3rd, regarding two of Governor DeSantis' recent executive orders regarding local government COVID-2019 restrictions and orders. I don't need to read the whole thing, but Mr. Oliva says Executive Orders 21102 only impacts city and county government, and it does not impact school districts and individual schools. He goes on to say Executive Orders only impact restrictive COVID-19 orders and ordinances that are adopted through emergency enactment. That is exactly what this mass mandate is, or rather was, a restrictive COVID-19 order. These ordinances that were adopted were adopted through emergency enactment. This blatant disregard of these two executive orders sends a message that the Orange County Public School Board must operate on some island of their own. They do not need to follow or acknowledge the Dr. Scott Ribikis, the Surgeon General, had issued a public health advisory stating that the constitution or the continuation rather of COVID-19 restrictions on individuals include long-term use of face covering and withdrawal from social and recreational gatherings pose a risk of adverse and unintended consequences. A mask, a message that the Orange County Public School can ignore all scientific study and show that vaccines protect individuals from COVID-19. And above all, Orange County Public School can ignore and not protect the rights and liberties of individuals. The tyranny that is happening today is rampant. The deep platforming, removal, and complete disregard of informa information regarding our health and our rights is alarming. Why are you pushing a one-sided narrative? 
The facts are out there. COVID-19 is treatable and in large part survivable. Many doctors, patients, and students have come forward with the truth and complaints about the mask. Students have suffered major health problems because of these endless mask mandates. Students have witnessed unrelenting, unrelenting rules for thee, but not for me, as teachers set aside the students' well-being in the name of the mask mandate. My daughter experienced it firsthand. She wanted to return to school so badly, only to have her teachers tell her she should just stay home. She went to the office to seek guidance because she was falling behind in her class, only to be, tr be treated like a nuisance because they did not want her there. Keep in mind, uh, the office was nearly empty and there was more than six feet between them. It's obvious there is a strong narrative meant to scare us and Ms. to Riley? take our rights and liberties away. Ms. Riley? Why would one only see... Ms. Riley? Yes. You're, I'm sorry. Your time is up. Um, let me take one minute just to clarify a point. We could, there's a lot of things we could debate here all day long. But one thing I did want to clarify, because I think it's important, um, the language from uh, the chancellor of K-12 education, he refers to um, what the executive orders do and don't apply to. You read it yourself. It actually says that it applies to emergency orders. The school board did, in fact, initially adopt an emergency order regarding pol uh, the policy of masks. But later, the school board came back and revised and went through the full process to adopt a regular policy. So that is why Jacob Olivia sent that email. He sent it to us um, in response to our questions to clarify that we did not fall under that emergency order. I'll be pleased to have our general counsel send you some more information. Again, a lot we can debate, but I don't want you leaving this conversation thinking that we were um, flying afoul of the um, executive order. Let's move on to our next uh, caller. Do we have caller number two on the line? Our next, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Our next caller is Krista Beaton. All right, thank you. Well, you're wel uh, welcome. Me? Hi, yes. um, my name's Krista. I'm calling from Winter Park. I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm here today to ask you to keep your word and make masks optional for the 21-22 school year. The Florida Department of Education has crunched the numbers and the data shows that face covering policies within school districts did not impact the spread of the virus. This was detailed in the memo that Richard Corcoran sent out to all school district superintendents when he asked you to make mask wearing voluntary. I have heard a number of comments about how wearing a mask is simple or just a piece of cloth and even that kids get used to it. I would argue that none of these statements are true for all kids. Wearing a mask has never been simple for my son. He has social anxiety which causes him to chew on it. We live in Florida so he sweats on it. When he gets nervous he chews pencils and has often chewed holes right through the mask. You can't convince me that elementary school kids are universally wearing masks correctly because we're not talking about doctors and nurses. We're talking about kids. These masks come home filthy. The rude comments about how they should be washed are not helpful. My son has different color masks to match every outfit and multiple designs for every holiday. I keep them clean. They still come home filthy and soaking wet and full of peanut butter and jelly and they still cause a rash on his face. Mandatory face covering policies inhibit peer-to-peer -peer learning. My four-year-old cannot learn to read phonetically if she cannot see her teacher's face. Young children are still learning social skills and seeing facial cues from their peers is critical to their learning. There are students who cannot and will not wear a mask and will therefore be denied a public school education if this policy is made mandatory again. The New York Times posted an article recently summarizing the leading causes of death among children in the United States. COVID comes in behind drowning, car accidents, homicide, cancer, cardiovascular disease, flu, and pneumonia. That means your child has a better chance dying in a car accident than dying of COVID and terrifying children into thinking that they're safer in a mask <clears throat> without considering these statistics is just wrong and unhelpful. And keeping kids in masks to protect their teachers 
is unreasonable since the great majority of teachers can be vaccinated if they choose. My family has already had COVID. My children have natural immunity. Masking my kids doesn't protect anyone and just makes it harder for them to learn and make friends. Sweeping one-size-fits-all mandates are not useful here. Please make the right decision and make masks optional. Thank you, Mr. Vita. Let's take caller number three. Our next caller is Laura Vale. Hi, um, my name is Laura Vale, and I live in Orlando in 32812 in District 6. Thank you for your time today. My son is six years old and will be going into first grade in public school here in Orlando. Making masks optional for students who are eligible for the vaccine is a reasonable decision, but making masks optional for children under 12 and the adults that teach them could be irresponsible and dangerous. The CDC recommends that anyone over the age of two who isn't fully vaccinated, i.e. students, teachers, and staff, should continue to wear masks indoors and try to keep three feet of distance. The EBBA on face coverings from last year even states that by wearing a face covering, the district is helping to protect students, employees, friends, family, and community members. A failure to wear a face covering can unnecessarily expose others to the health risks caused by COVID-19. So I ask you, what has changed for children under 12 between the last school year and now? The pandemic isn't over. The Delta variant is out there and is highly transmittable. While we know that vaccines are the best way to stop the spread of infections, masking is vital in the absence of vaccination. The science say masks work. Children under 12 can't yet be vaccinated, therefore they still need to wear masks. School should be a safe place for my son to go and learn and have fun. Not a place where I worry about him catching COVID because some people can't be bothered to do their part. How is my son supposed to learn science? if the schools won't even follow the science on masks. How can you teach him to be kind and look out for others when no one is doing that for him? If masks become optional, will there be bullying of the children who wear them? Those who oppose masks are claiming it's a personal choice and their freedom, but their freedom stops where mine begins. The personal choice to not wear a mask can harm those who choose to wear one, therefore no longer making it just a personal choice since it affects others. Reverend Peter Marshall, a former chaplain of the U.S. Senate said, may we think of freedom, not as the right to do as we please, but as the opportunity to do what is right. Keeping masks mandatory for children under 12 until there's a vaccine available for them is what is right. We wear masks to protect others. If no one else is going to wear one, who will protect my child? I beg you to please put these young children's health and safety first by keeping masks mandatory. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take our next um, phone caller. Our next caller is Lauren Miller. Hello, this is Lauren Miller, high school board members. I am a mom of two kids going into kindergarten and third grade, and we live in the Avalon Park area. I wanted to call in and thank the majority of you for supporting the masks optional for students and teachers next year, and I look forward to finalizing this today. Here's the thing. I've been listening to everyone, and all parents, everyone has different opinions, strong opinions on how this should work for next year. And it's because everyone has different strong opinions and there isn't one, you know, opinion, I, I guess you could, you know, I probably think my opinion is the best, but there is not one, you know, shoe that fits everyone. That's why I think masks should be optional. All summer, for us, my kids have been traveling. They've been to camp. My son's baseball team went to a district tournament, state tournament. We were in hotels. We were with baseball teams from other parts of the state. Everyone is still doing great. There were no masks, no issues. And if someone did wear a mask, that was their choice. Um, I truly feel that a mask mandate for us would hinder my kids more than it's actually going to help them. It will interfere with um, my children's speech, language, and social interactions in kindergarten. 
It will make it difficult to breathe and be comfortable in school all day. And the stats just don't justify forcing kids to wear them. So let each family decide what they would like their kids to do. And then I also just wanted to quickly touch on Part B of this policy. Absolutely no. This needs to be um, the next battle for sure. The superintendent should not have the authority to be making a change whenever she wants this policy. This is not politics. This needs to be the right thing. I think that Part B, definitely we need to you know, touch base on that later. But for now, we need to just move forward with making the masks optional for next year. Um, let's move forward with some normalcy, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Let's take our next caller. Our next caller is Brittany Jones. Ms. Jones. Hi there, my name is Brittany Jones. I'm in Orlando at 32821, which I believe is District 4. And I just want to say thank you for hearing all of us today as we hopefully reach some sort of conclusion to this mask policy. I am um, coming before you today to just uh, add my support in bringing masks to an optional conclusion for this year. Um, it's been interesting to listen and watch here on YouTube. And, you know, like the previous caller said, there's a lot of very strong opinions. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing about is science, which, yay, science. I love science. Um, I'm actually a very big believer in science. And um, I think that's the reason why I choose, um, I believe that masks should be optional. You know, when you tell people that the recovery rate for COVID is 99% or higher, this is a scientific fact, and it's a very good scientific fact. We should be happy and celebrating that so many of our students came through last year, like another gentleman said, resilient. They're fine. And as the previous caller said, we're ready to get back to some sense of normalcy. Science is supposed to be challenged questions tested and scrutinized, that's the entire point. So if that's not permissible, then what are we doing? I remember doing my science fair project, it starts with a hypothesis, which is a guess, and you go on from there, proven either false or true. The thing that I'm most concerned about, in addition to part B of this, is some other things that were brought up today, like the Delta variant. Um, in the history of virology, there's never ever been a viral mutation that resulted in a virus that was more lethal. As viruses mutate, they become more contagious, transmissible, but less lethal. And then you've also heard parents speak on the fact of this um, vaccination, which is very scary, actually. Um, Israeli data shows boys and men between the ages of 16 and 24 who have been vaccinated have 25 times the rate of heart inflammation than normal, and children are 50 times more likely to die from the COVID vaccine than the virus, which that is a quote by the former Pfizer vice president. Um, please keep in mind that as most of these parents have said, you do not necessarily have the authority to make a medical decision for myself or anyone in my family. And so to keep masks optional allows the opportunity for each parent to make that medical decision for their child. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing masks being optional next year. Thank you. Let's take our next caller. Our next caller is Megan Kaur. Hello, my name is Megan Kaur. I reside in Orlando, 32801. Sorry I could not be there in person, but I thank you for this opportunity to speak. As an emergency medicine physician and mother of an Orange County student, I'm speaking today to ask the board to amend the policy to make face coverings mandatory for children under 12, only until that age group has the opportunity to obtain the vaccine should they choose. Many of the expert physician members of the medical advisory committee at the June 1st meeting also expressed concern regarding this policy and our youngest students under 12 who are currently ineligible to receive the vaccine. Why aren't we listening to them? The very policy in debate quotes the state surgeon general advising that face coverings should no longer be advised for those who are, and I emphasize, fully vaccinated, which does not include our children under 12. Since the last meeting, the CDC has also released updated guidance along with the American Academy of Pediatrics 
continuing to advise the use of face coverings in those who are not fully vaccinated. Why are we not listening to their advice? While MISC and death appear to be rare events in the pediatric population due to COVID, I have personally, in my emergency department, seen a number of children suffering with long-term effects, including headaches, chest pain, fatigue, brain fog, and other complications that affect their quality of life due to COVID. I've also heard lots of claims about masks making our children sick. And generally, that's not the truth. This was my first season in my eight years of practice in the ER not seeing a single case of influenza. It's not a conspiracy. The masks are effective. Regarding the Gainesville study continually referenced, they only tested six masks, not near enough to make any valid conclusions. Three of those masks, 50%, were actually completely fine, and there's no feasible pathophysiologic way that bacteria in a mask can cause a urinary tract infection. Other bacteria found in this study are only transmitted by tick bites and not even endemic to Florida. It's more logical to consider this group just needs a new cleaner mask supplier than the fact that masks are making these children sick. I fully respect the decision of those who are hesitant or have not yet received the vaccine. It is their right to make that choice, but until it becomes available to our children under 12 and they can make that decision for themselves, it seems irresponsible to subject them to the added risk of optional masking for everyone. I urge the board members to consider amending the policy to continue mandatory face coverings in our elementary schools only until the vaccine is widely available. Let's listen to our medical experts on this evolving healthcare crisis and the overwhelming, they overwhelmingly support that face coverings for unvaccinated individuals including our students under 12 is important. This includes our medical advisory committee, our state surgeon general, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC. Thank you. All right, let's take our next caller. Our last caller is Nikita Shaw. Hi, this is Dr. Nikita Shaw. I'm a family medicine physician in Orlando, Florida. I have two children who are entering second grade. Um, for the last year, I've been pivoting just like all of you, preparing my clinic to take on the pandemic, caring for my patients, being a mom, sorry, I'm going to get teary, um, and protecting my patients and family seriously. Things weren't looking good clinically earlier in the summer, um, but things aren't looking good right now, specifically right now. One of the most important powers you have as a board and as a superintendent is to safeguard the public's health. The cases of COVID-19 have increased in the last few weeks, namely because of the Delta variant. The infectivity rate in Orlando is increasing and I fear we are approaching a dense outbreak. The mutation gives advantages over other strains, making it more transmissible. Believe me, masks work. During peak cold and flu season, just like Dr. Kaur was saying, I didn't have patients with cold with flu this year in December or January. My patients at the time when everyone was wearing masks didn't have colds, didn't have congestions, no asthma exacerbation. Masks help reduce viral spread when everyone wears one, and that's why we've actually done relatively well with this pandemic thus far. But what I've seen in the last few weeks is an increase in illnesses. So although socially it looks like things are normal, I'm in the clinic and people are getting sick and there's more COVID-19 cases. I hear the concerns about our children and their own well-being and personal development, I'm a mom, I have twins, I get it. I wish we didn't have to deal with COVID-19, but I also think it's important to recognize that children have lost family members to COVID, parents, relatives, and everyone getting sick also has an impact on them. So please mandate masks for our elementary school children who are not eligible for vaccines so that I can comfortably send my children back to school and so that I can care for my community fam community's family while you educate mine. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was, I believe, our last caller. Is that correct? I'll take that as a yes. Yes, that is correct. Thank you so much. Okay, I will open it up to um, board discussion. May start with Member Gallo. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. When I pushed my button, I didn't realize I would be number one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, member Castrodental is number two. Okay. Uh, Bird is number three. Member Castrodental, you couldn't have pushed that button just a little quicker. Um, so just to, uh, first off, I want to thank everybody who came out today and, and, and shared their opinion. I want you to know that um, as a board member, I listened wholeheartedly t to everyone. 
I know that many are frightened by the COVID-19. I wish the COVID-19 didn't exist. I am, I am nervous about this, this Delta variant and what it means to our community. Um, there's a lot of different information out there. We have two sides of, of each, the unmask and the mask, and I don't know that anybody is right or wrong because you can find evidence, you can find research that would support both theories. Um, I was looking at the positivity rates today, and if you took the positivity rates of children under 12 and you divided it by the total population in that in that age range, it was at 0. .00007. Now, when you took the rate and you compared it to those who were tested, it's around 7%. It makes you much higher, but you can't just look at who's been tested. You've got to look at the population as a whole to kind of deem where we're at. I did a lot of research prior to this board meeting um, about the effects of masks, um, how they helped, they hurt. I looked at a lot of information from daycares who've been in operation since day one. Uh, they never shut down. They did not mask, and there was not massive COVID outbreaks in daycares, which which leads me to believe that it's not it, it's not as prominent in our youth. Uh, those 12 or older can get vaccinated if they choose to do so. I did get vaccinated. I believe that the vaccine works. I also respect everybody's right to choose what is best for them and their body. Um, but I did because I felt like that that was best for me, my family, and my community. Um, like I said, it's just it. There, there, there's a lot going on. But what I believe is is that our surrounding area. Uh, including the mayor who's concerned about what's going on in our community has recommended that those wear masks in in small places indoors um, if you cannot be socially distanced it was a recommendation it was not a mandate everywhere else in the central florida era, area there is recommendations there is not mandates it has to be left up to those individuals to decide what is best for them and their family and their child and I respect that. I personally don't like to wear a mask. I don't have an issue wearing a mask. If I fly, if I'm he in a place that mandates a mask, I will gladly put my mask on without any, any um, trouble at all. But it has to be a recommendation, and I support the recommendation. I support this policy as written. I agree with the Part B. I know what our intent of that policy is, um, and I'm not certain that the language does match the intent of the policy. I would be willing to review that at a later date um, if the board so agreed with me, just to, to tighten up that language so, so that it was very clear. I have the most f faith in my superintendent and I know that she wouldn't, she wouldn't do um, anything without consulting the board um, prior to implementing any type of um, mask mandate in our schools. So I just wanna say, you know, thank you. I know that this has been hard. It's been hard on all of us. We've lost sleep. I want you to know that I listen to everybody and I, lis I got hundreds of emails today, so I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be honest, I haven't gotten through them all, but I really appreciate everyone that reached out and I, I, I feel for, for both sides, um, but I just think that it's best for our community to move forward and I think it's best left in the hands of the parents to decide what's best for the children, so I will support this policy today. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gallo. Member Castardano. Policy before us is to allow for a more nimble and responsive approach to COVID, but given the Delta variant rise and that vaccine rates have stalled and that our community is now labeled high risk, I don't believe we can protect our kids and employees without maintaining a required mask policy. Are masks inconvenient? Yes. Are they difficult for some? Yes. Are they irritating? Yes. Can they get dirty? Yes. Are masks foolproof? No, but they add an important layer of protection to those who wear them, and even greater protection when we all wear them. Seat belts won't always save a life, but more lives are saved when we wear them. They can be uncomfortable and restrictive, but more people can walk away from an otherwise deadly crash if they wear seat belts. My children didn't always like riding in a car seat, but it was the safest thing to do. It's the same with COVID. More people can walk away with their lives and long-term health intact if they wear a mask around others. Some people have written to me that, that children are not a source of COVID spread, but that's not true. For instance, my son is working as a camp counselor this summer 
and all the employees had to show proof of vaccination. Every camper had to get tested, have a negative test before coming to camp, and they were screened when they got dropped off. It worked well until this week when COVID found a way in and it spread through the camp like wildfire, and many kids were sent home in the middle of the week with COVID, and even the adults at the camp who were each vaccinated, many of them still got COVID, including my son, and they either went home or they were quarantined. And these were healthy kids and young adults. They spent their waking hours outdoors, but for those who say kids don't spread COVID, that's wrong. Now imagine concentrating hundreds of kids in cramped classrooms where most, if not all, are both unvaccinated and unmasked. And consider the disruption to the schools when whole classes are sent home. Consider parents who have finally been able to return to work who must stay home with their kids for a week. This coming year, we will have full classrooms without the benefit of distancing or vaccines for students, and there's a highly contagious COVID Delta variant. To me, making masks optional when schools open is not the direction we should be going, and changing our policy to make them optional seems premature. As of today, we do not have a plan in place to protect our medically vulnerable students or employees when school starts. The CDC recommends that only vaccinated people should not wear masks indoors. That means all unvaccinated should wear masks indoors. Mayor Demings, we've heard, officially recommended that masks be used by all people, vaccinated and unvaccinated, when in crowded indoor places. We have a duty to protect our students and our greater community and since the governor won't allow us to mandate vaccines for our employees, and we can't ask who's been vaccinated, then we need to be conservative in our approach and continue masking for all until we have reached a threshold of people vaccinated to protect those who remain at risk. I know some people think that getting the vaccine is risky, but actually it's riskier to not get the vaccine and to get COVID. The vaccine isn't the experiment, COVID is. COVID has killed over 600,000 people in the U.S., and others are still suffering from long-term effects. I realize there is vaccine hesitancy as folks wait to find out as much as they can before getting their shot. But if you hesitate too long, another variant will mutate in folks who are unvaccinated and only prolong this pandemic. So on this policy before us today, I support the superintendent's ability to uh, respond to changes in COVID in real time, according to advice from medical authorities and in consultation with the board. However, I do not believe that uh, the school board should start with optional masks or the school year. The default should be that masks are in place for all students while giving the authority to the superintendent to change when it's prudent. Requiring masks for all people indoors protects not only the most vulnerable among us, it protects the most unlucky as well. I understand this policy we are voting on should make it easier to make real life changes in response to changing variants and vaccination rates, but I think it actually makes it more difficult for the district to maintain adequate safety measures to keep our children and employees safe. Thank you. Thank you, Member Castrodano. Okay, uh, Member Bird. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, for me, this decision tonight comes down to um, the important aspect of moving this from a policy to a management decision, which is where I really feel like it needs to be. Um, uh, Superintendent Jenkins is in constant communication every day I believe probably <laughs> with um, Dr. Pino in the health department and she's talks to the mayor frequently I think that this decision is best left to her and her staff her emergency group that gets together they meet they they've done it all year every um, I believe every week probably more frequently than that going over the um, the emergency um, not the emergency the, the uh, mandates for the self and, self and um, health and safety manual. They've done a great job 
with all of those things all year, I believe that this decision needs to be in her hands and their hands with consultation with the board. Um, I don't, I did not like the fact that this policy was, that this was in policy where it took us two months to make changes. Um, when we were doing well at the beginning of the summer and they said that you didn't need to wear masks anymore if you were vaccinated, I wanted to be able to let our teachers not have to wear masks in summer school if they were vaccinated, but we couldn't do that because it took us this long to get here because it was in policy. So I think that being able to be nimble and make changes as we need to, um, it, that, this, that we need to have in policy that um, it gives that decision to the superintendent and she needs to make those changes quickly. Um, now that is to not say that I'm not also extremely concerned about our rising rates. As I said a month ago at our last meeting, I was excited because we were at 3%. <laughs> now we're at like seven. So um, yeah, I'm extremely concerned. I'm extremely concerned as Dr. Castro Dental said about sticking kids in a classroom unmasked and um, unvaccinated. But it's also four weeks away from the beginning of the school year. And as I said, I think that this needs to be looked at continually every day with constant communication with our local health department. Um, and I have full confidence that, um, that our superintendent and her staff can do what needs to be done and do it quickly and make changes if we need to. Um, so I am in favor of the policy the way it is written, um, and I will be supporting it tonight. Um, Member Felder, do you mind if um, I uh, interrupt for just a minute to try to clarify a point? So I, I think I need clarification from the superintendent and our general counsel because as it was pointed out by, by at least one or two speakers, I think that one could read this language slightly different. So the superintendent began her remarks by saying that only if there is a mandate by the CDC or by um, another government jurisdiction, th do I have that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Jenkins? The mayor. Yeah. The mayor. Um, and, the CDC. okay, and I don't, the CDC can't mandate, but the mayor. So. Um, I just want to I just want to make sure as whatever decision we make that we're clear about the ramifications so the idea that the superintendent in consultation with her staff would have the operational authority to make a decision dr. Jenkins your understanding of the policy yeah and I believe um, uh, Member Byrd said in consultation with staff and with Dr. Pino and others. So when I read the policy, two things are critical. One, as the chair has mentioned and others have mentioned, I work for eight bosses. There is no way I would make a decision without any consultation with the school board. That's number one. Number two, the policy speaks to CDC or other governmental entities issuing updated guidance that mandates more restrictive face coverings. It would not be done lightly. Uh, with, uh, um, without something significant taking place. I read that language to mean, should that be the case, something pretty serious is going on in the entire community. In such an instance, the board would not have to take months to actually try to get through a policy. We would be able to move nimbly to do what is best for our students and for our employees regarding uh, face coverings based on that guidance. Uh, but again, I think it's twofold. I don't do anything without consultation with my eight bosses. And the wording, I think, speaks to exactly what Mayor Deming said yesterday. He said, I'm recommending. I'm not ready to make a mandate at this point. But that does mean also that it could come, that it may come to a point where a mandate from a governmental entity is more necessary. Madam Chair. Okay. Um and, and I wanted that clarification because I, I think I am, I think, Member Bird, I'm where you are, that I want to see a policy that gives us the ability to be more nimble. I would, I, I would hope and pray that this year we do not have to have the same level of layers, whether we're talking about masks, social distancing, the things that we've done. I, if we stayed at 3% or lower um, as more vaccines become available, I 
don't anticipate this being a year where masks are on all year. Um, but I also, like you, want to would prefer that we be able to adapt quickly. Um, as I see the Delta variant, I, I know we all are. We're watching carefully to see what effect it's having on children, spread rate, et cetera. And I was trying to get clarification. Do we have to have a mandate from the mayor in order for this for us to give direction to the superintendent to reimpose the mask mandate for children under 12 based on conditions? And so I, I'm going to direct that question back to Dr. Jenkins and or general counsel. I work for eight members of yeah. the board. I will work in consultation with you uh, regarding any adjustments to okay. our mask requirements. Okay, and, and Ms. Enval, in terms of whether we would be in legal compliance with our policy, if we adopt this policy, and if the board sees a dangerous trend regarding the Delta variants, and my, my concern would be something that is affecting our children more severely than has been the case in the past, could we direct the superintendent to reimpose a mandatory mask requirement? You can, and the board always has the opportunity to uh, meet in an emergency session and do emergency rulemaking, which requires two days' notice. So we can always do that okay. as well. All right, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Member Felder, thank you for um, allowing me to, to interject there just to get some clarity before we went on to further conversation sure member felder you're recognized yes thank you first of all good evening to all of you in the room and <clears throat> i want to thank you i am a person that i love debate and uh <laughs> i welcome uh the differences of opinion you know variety as to the spice of life and secondly as a, a former teacher i am excited about the enthusiasm of parents and you know, I talked with uh, council uh, uh, the other day because I had some mixed feelings about the mask and uh, what happened over the weekend. I had an, I had an opportunity to keep uh, my sorority sister's grandchildren. One of them is two and the other one is four. So, of course, I had to wear the mask. And the four-year-old just, oh, he was just having a hard time and just crying and Please don't make me wear the mask. Please don't. And I said, you've got to wear. And I just got a different perspective about the mask for little kids. But at the same time, we're in Florida. They're from D.C. Well, I mean Atlanta, but we were in Florida. And, uh, and I felt compelled to protect uh, this child that was in my custody. And, but I, for the first time, I, I understood how he must have felt. Uh, the two-year-old didn't have a problem, but he really was going through some changes. But the same same token, I wanted to say, I hope you all understand that this has been a very difficult journey for this board, including the superintendent, as we deal with the mask wearing and mandating. And then as teachers, you know, I would hope not, I would hope a teacher wouldn't make a child feel uncomfortable whether they had the mask on or not because your business is there to teach them. However, I do understand the concern. And I do believe that parents should have the wherewithal to make a decision about where they want their children. But at the same token, if something happens, you need to also take that responsibility because that was based on a decision that you made. So um, I do uh, I am in favor of an idea, of the idea to let you choose. But I, I do still have some concerns about younger children who may be vulnerable and, uh, you know, they're young and, and sometimes, you know, that you can't, you don't know what decisions to make. But because I sit on this board and because I was elected uh, by people to sit on this board and to be a voice for the people, and members of my constituency, they do have real concerns about the mask. And many of them have said they wanted it optional. Some have said they want it mandated, especially for children that are under 12 or cannot take the vaccine. But 
again as I close, I am going to contend with the uh, the decision to give make it optional, and you need to be responsible as a parent to make sure that you are tending to your child. But again, for those parents who have the little ones, I, I know I, I feel you. I had that experience this weekend, and I saw what it did to him, the one that was four. I saw how uncomfortable he was. But at the same time, we got to look at it from a holistic point of view. So that, that's my concern. Thank, Thank you. you, Member Felder. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that personal experience as well with your, with your grandbaby. Let's hear from Member Cobert. Thank you, Chair. Can you give me a quick sound check? You sound wonderful, Member Covert. Thank you. So just like all of the other board members, um, I have received hundreds and hundreds of emails. And, and I want to let the public know that because of the volume, we can read all of them. And I do read all of them and listen to your input, but it's impossible to respond. I also want you to know that this decision weighs heavily on all of us. I still have a child in school and I think every day about her, her friends and, and her teachers. Like other board members, I've done an enormous amount of personal research on this in order to make an informed decision. And there really are no definitive answers. You can find a, a bounty of evidence on both sides of this issue. I too have great concern for our children under 12 who are unable to be back vaccinated. And because of my personal family situation, if I had a child under 12, I would choose to send them in a face cover. But that is my personal decision based on my family situation. Orange County is recommending that those who are indoors um, mask up. I think the district will align with that recommendation because I think it's prudent, but not with a mandate. Understand that there will still be systems in place in conjunction with the Department of Health and the CDC. And uh, we will still have um, contact tracing. Quarantine will still happen if there are positive cases. Hand washing, sanitizing, and distancing where possible will still happen. And I anticipate and I'm very hopeful that a vaccine will be available during the first quarter or semester of the school year. As far as part B, I look at that as a safety net in the event of an emergency. This situation since March of last year has been ever changing, constantly changing, guidance changing, recommendations changing, practices changing. So we need that flexibility and the superintendent's decisions are not made in a vacuum. She will make those decisions along with the board, along with the Department of Health, along with state, federal, and local guidelines. So I have confidence in her. As I said at the last meeting, if we were to continue the mask mandate, our children would be the only citizens in Orange County left under a mask mandate. No other citizens in Orange County exist under that mandate. And I also believe very strongly that families with immune compromised members, medical conditions or other concerns should consult with their own physicians to make an informed decision for their family. But those are their own decisions for their family. So for those reasons um, and with complete respect for those with different opinions, I am going to support the policy as recommended. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Copert. Member Lopez. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you as well for the questions for the uh, council and the superintendent. I have the same questions. Even right now, <laughs> I'm just having crossed it out because, you know, uh, I, I am in favor of the optional masking, but I also have the concerns for elementary school kids. Um, and I understand um, as a mom that, you know, I cannot um, tell other parents to vaccinate their children, even when I believe in that. 
Um, I would like to know um, also about encouraging the use of the mask for um, those employees that are not vaccinated and those kids that are in risk. Maybe a recommendation or maybe something pretty cool on the website so nobody feel um, isolated or feel uncomfortable just by using the mask because they need it. Um, I, I also, um, now I was thinking about, um, you know, the social and emotional, and I clearly understand, but I, I also understand the high risk, um, conditions and, you know, and, and also it's, it's also about life, you know, because every, every parent, every family have different stories and I respect all of them. Um, I, I would be hypocritical if I just say, ah, because of the majority think this way, I'm gonna forget about the only child that maybe feel a certain way or is facing critical conditions. I'm a mom. So as a mother, I, I would love to see the smile of my, of my daughter in high school, of course, um, but I, I don't want to put in risk anybody's life. Mm -hmm. So even though I will be voting in favor of the optional masking, because I trust that if something happened with the numbers in the county, we will be very um, assertive in having that meeting and go back to the masking because it's about life. It's not about political issues at this point. Well, well said, Member Lopez. Uh, Member Gallo. Um, I'm I'm good, Madam Chair. Okay. I was All just right, it was a clarification you. that the general counsel already made about right, the emergency board meeting. Thank you. Um, well, I I've, I've got to say I have listened to each board member and and I agree with pretty much everything that you all have said. I think for me, um, Member Lopez, your comments about every child and that responsibility that we have towards every child um, makes this more difficult. I look at the numbers out there, the number of children um, that have been um, seriously affected by COVID and I recognize it is a small number. Um, but I worry about the Delta variant and I worry about what happens in the next four weeks. I respect your strong opinions on both sides of this. I think one of one or more of you have pointed out that I can find data to support both arguments. Um, in I, I at this point where we are, I agree that I think we should be moving forward with a path of optional. But I also think it's extremely important that we be able to change even if that means we're changing between now and the start of the school year mm -hmm. depending on what we see with the delta variant exactly. um, i think i mentioned this um dr jenkins when i was asking questions because i wanted clarification of exactly what that would take but if we see that there is greater risk to our unvaccinated age population or under 12 and I, I'm saying this because uh, you all would be very, very unhappy with me if we go this direction, and I understand that. And as much as I hate to have people unhappy with me, um, I can take people being very unhappy with me. I work very, very hard for people not to lose trust. So somebody said, don't go back on our word in terms of how we were gonna vote today. And, and I heard that and it bothered me a little because when we passed this forward to this point, we did not bring it forward with a promise that we're gonna vote for it. We said, if we're gonna vote for something, this is what we're gonna vote for. So I wanna be honest with you that if I believe in my heart of hearts that a decision that I've made is putting our children at, at significant risk and that they would be safer with masks, then I will be back here advocating for that, regardless of the number of people who will dislike me. So know that today. I reserve the right um, to come back and revisit this data every single day. And you reserve the right to advocate fiercely for or against my opinion on this. And that's what makes, that's what makes us the country that we are. That at least, is, I've heard talk about freedom. I will tell you, I started out, I don't like these masks, okay? 
but I will wear them in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. If I think that I can save one person's life or keep them from getting hospitalized, I will wear this in a heartbeat. It's not, this to me, it, I know it feels like freedom to you. My version of freedom, I'm okay, I'm free. I'm free because I can say what I'm saying and you can say what you're saying and we can disagree. And I know the countries where this could never in a million years happen. We could never have this conversation today. So that's my, that's my caliber for free. I look at smoking and you know, people ask, well, if, if I have the right to tell my child to put a mask on, then what's the problem? The theory being, whether you accept it or not, the theory being that two masks are better than one and that the risk is actually greater that you will um, send the virus out than that you will take it in. So the, the mask is supposedly, to those who believe in masks, I do, you don't, I, I know, that I am protecting you more than I'm protecting myself. Just like if I'm smoking cigarettes, we gave, you might disagree with this, but we gave up that freedom, not we gave up, People lost that freedom in this country. You can't smoke cigarettes in most places indoors because of secondhand smoke. To me, the mask is kind of like that, that I'm protecting somebody from secondhand COVID virus that I could have. I'm okay with that. Um, I do recognize that for some of our kids, it's been harder than others. Uh, I recognize there's great value in our children being able to play on the ball field and 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 be kids. And there's psychological and social value to all that. I recognize all that. And all of those things bring me to, I think, I think we're at the point where optional should be the case for this coming year. I don't know if we will be at the point in four weeks where we should be optional or we should be mandatory for our children under 12. And I think that remains in my mind to be seen. And with that, I will vote for this today with the caveat that every day I think we don't need to look at the information. I will entertain a motion at this time from any member of the board who would like to make one. I'll move to um, approve the the policy the way it's currently, the new policy the way it's Okay, currently. we have a motion from Member Byrd to adopt the policy as drafted. And we have a second from Member Gallo. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, uh, Member Cobert. Aye, Chair. Uh, all opposed? Nay. Okay. Let the motion, let the record reflect that all members present, um, including Member Covert, voted in the affirmative with the exception of Member Castor Deb. All right, we will move on to, um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. If there's no uh, discussion, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda. Move. So moved. A motion by Member Castor Dennell, seconded by Member Lopez. All in favor? Please aye. say aye. 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 Member Covert? Aye. Was that an aye? That's an aye, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Opposed? Motion carries you now, uh, with all members present voting in the affirmative. And now we're going to move on to non consent agenda item number 1701. A good news item. It is a good news item, Madam Chair and members of the board. We are very pleased that OESPA has come to conclusion and agreement on their contract for last year. It includes um, the payment of a one-time bonus to our classified employees in benefited positions. With the board's approval, we will move forward swiftly with taking care of that provision for all of our classified employees in benefited positions. Madam Chair. All right. All right. Thank you. Dr. Jenkins, I think if I ask for a motion, I will probably have seven of them. Yes. And yeah. there are only seven of us here today. So moved. <laughs> so a motion by Member Castor Dennell. She got in there first. A second? Second. Second by Member Bird. Bird. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Member Covert? A big aye. A big aye. <laughs> Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Dr. Jenkins. Um, any report for the board? I have a very brief report. And, and let me mention also, I believe uh, Ron Pollard is actually out of town or he would have been here with a big smile on his face. I want to say that in his Good. stead, uh, he will be here to see you the next time he, when we have a meeting once he's returned from vacation. I have one announcement um, for my report because I'm very pleased to share it. We are going to get this information out to our 2020 uh, 20 graduates 
uh, because it's a well-kept secret, we want everyone to know that Valencia College has enrolled, for every enrolled student, a $1,500 grant. It's an emergency grant through the American Rescue Plan because they have received over $102 million of funding this year. They should not be directly marketing that provision, but I can. <laughs> so we are going to have a Connect Orange message going out to last year's seniors because many of them, they, um, uh, Valencia in particular, is, uh, is down, I believe, more than 15%. Uh, perhaps it's, uh, I'm sorry, they're down 1,500 students when they compare enrollment. We know some of our graduates, if they knew there was a provision for them, would be in school. So each semester they are eligible for at least $1,500. There's no requirement for having filled out a FAFSA. There's no uh, documentation of citizenship required. If they are enrolled, they are eligible for the $1,500. It is a provision under the COVID-19 relief. Uh, it can be used for tuition, housing, health care, or child care. It's a grant for students who are enrolled at Valencia, $1,500 eligible for each semester. Awesome. That information is going to be going out to all of our seniors, uh, their parents, and those households. We will put it on our website as well. Uh, thanks to uh, the new Valencia College president, uh, Kathleen Pinsky, who um, spoke with me yesterday. We are happy to help spread that good news for our families and communities. That is all, Madam Chair. That is so awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Member Gallo? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had an announcement to make, and, I, and I've already informed um, the superintendent, but um, in last year's legislative session, there was a bill that created a council for early growth early grade success, which was going to look at early childhood and the, um, the assessments and stuff needed to make sure that our, our youngest students were, college, were kindergarten ready. And I am very honored to announce that I have been appointed to that um, council. It's called the Council for Early Grade Success. So it begins today and runs through um, 2025. Or actually, it began on July 1st. But I just wanted to share that good news. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, me uh, member. Ms. Anvil? I just have one. Um, I had sent you all an email before. We are in need of an appointment for an alternate citizen member to the VAB. And uh, there are some requirements for that. I know it probably got lost in all your emails mm. that you received. Mm. But um, the citizen alternate has to meet the minimum qualifications that would include that they own a business that occupies commercial s uh, space within Orange County and plans to remain in the space as an owner of the business for the duration of the upcoming VAB mm. cycle that they are not a member of any taxing authority, they don't represent any property owners, appraisers, tax collectors, or tax authorities in any review of property taxes, and that they don't have a conflict of interest or appearance of a conflict of interest. So I would love to have an alternate citizen member on the next board agenda, just in case our primary member cannot make it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that is not for a board member. No, no, nobody, no, no, nobody no, gets no, no, no. Okay, no, no, no. So we can appoint somebody? Yes. yes. Think oh, about okay. somebody you might want to appoint to that. Yes. Yes. If yes, you were just <laughs> if, yeah. analyzing oh, our, yeah. our lives. <laughs> Provide oh. me with your recommendations, and I will make sure it gets yeah. on the next agenda. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. 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 Yeah. Uh -oh. huh. Yeah, it's a, you know, those, those boards are a great learning opportunity for people. Um, I would encourage you to kind of think of the next generation here yeah. and some people that you think, oh, it would be a good idea to get, you know, a good opportunity for them to get their feet wet and to learn a little bit more about how things work. So give that some thought, okay? Awesome. All right, good. And, and, and if you don't, want, we'll appoint one of you. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We can't actually do that, but it, it would work. Um, that is it for you? Okay, any other announcements from board members? All right, all right. Good job, board. Tough, <laughs> very tough decision. Um, very, very tough decision. I don't think any of us, when we ran for office, thought we would be faced with the decisions we've been faced with for this past year, but I do wanna commend this entire board for working together so well. Dr. Jenkins for you and Ms. Envall for the whole team. But the board in particular, even when we disagree, I appreciate that everybody is so terribly respectful and understanding of each other. Thank you. All right, meeting adjourned. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 I know. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>